What's good, everybody? Fantastic Hip Hop back here with a brand new video. And today, we're going to be doing a 2023 album tier list ranking. Now, as of recording this video, it is March. So we are one fourth into the hip hop year. And so far, it's been pretty interesting. I mean, on one hand, we have had albums that have pushed the genre's limits in every single way possible. But on the other, we have had a lot of mediocrity. So today, we're going to be looking at every single record that has released, and we're going to be seeing what the best projects are and what the worst projects are. Hit that subscribe button, and without further ado, let's get right into it. The first project we are going to be looking at is Yeet's Afterlife. As somebody who has been very critical of Yeet's full-length records in the past, this was Yeet's magnum opus. Now, the biggest reason why this project works so well is because Yeet fixed all of the issues that were plaguing his other records. Now, the first thing is the length. Now, listen, this album is 22 songs long, and it definitely could have been cut down a little, but I get it. You got to get your streaming back, whatever. Now, most important thing is that in these 22 songs, the pacing of this project is fixed. Songs have room to breathe. Songs don't just feel like one conjoining experience. Each song feels like a distinct moment that does something distinctively different. Now, granted, Yeet's not talking about anything different, and he's really not doing anything different, but the beats are just tuned just enough to sound and feel like different atmospheres and different worlds, and that's very good. Now, the next thing is that Yeet's voice, he just nails it on this project. When Yeet's voice is done right, he is one of the most interesting artists in all of hip-hop. But when his voice misses the mark, and that could be because of mixing issues, it could be because of the way he's using his voice, it could be because of post-production editing, any of those things can just throw Yeet's voice off just a little bit. And Yeet's voice is the center instrument of everything his music is about. So when it misses, when it's slightly off, his music just does not resonate for me. It can be too whiny, too scratchy, too distorted. And overall, this just can mess up the entire experience. So Yeet's voice is perfect here. He really understands how to play with it. He really understands how to build tracks around it. And this really does benefit the listening experience. Afterlife is just a fun record. It has great hype songs. It's great to just hear Yeet go crazy over these spacey beats and for all of the formula that he's been trying to perfect to finally really hit well. I think Afterlife was a really strong step in Yeet's career. And I think that this was the magnum opus of the style that he has been trying to perfect and master since 2020. So, for all the reasons I have said, I'm going to be putting Afterlife in the C tier. As again, I don't think the stakes of this project are incredibly high, and I still think there is a lot of room for Yeet to improve, but this is a really enjoyable and a really fun record. Now, the next album we are looking at, which if you watch my videos in the past, you know how I feel about this project, is Baby Tron's Bin Reaper 3. Now, honestly, like this was a crime against humanity for how long he made this no artist can really make a project that's 30 songs long, not even like a Kendrick Lamar or a J. Cole or whatever. Like, Baby Tron, you're making a 30 song project? You? Like, come on. This was just ridiculous. Looking back at this record, it's aged even worse than I felt about it when I first reviewed it, as this record is just so mid. It's so boring. If this was like 10 songs, as I said, it would have been fine, but Baby Tron style is not unique enough and it's not captivating enough to go for this long. This bar heavy style gets tiring after like six songs and now you're gonna tell me that you're gonna go for 26 tracks which run for over an hour and 12 minutes? That is just insane. I'm really done with Babytron at this point as this record just tired me out for a very long time. So I'm going to be putting Bin Reaper 3 in the E tier. Generously, I'll say that too. Already in March, and we have got another Baby Tron record. And it's really, again, it's not good. I mean, let's say a few things. Out on Bond is an EP. So it's only five songs. It's only five songs thank god because if this was more than five songs i would have just not listened at this point but i mean look at the cover art bro this looks like one of the most low budget and low stakes projects that has been released by a major artist in quite some time 
Now, this record isn't incredibly bad like Bin Reaper 3, where it's just so tedious, it's so painful, it's so boring, and it's so uninnovative. This record is just boring. It's just straight out boring. Five songs of Babytron being Babytron with no spice, with no flair. And even if this project was remotely good, it automatically would just be inherently less interesting because Babytron gave us a 30 song disaster like two months before. So I'm going to be putting out on Bond right in the E tier. Listen, it's better than Bin Reaper 3. It's going to go above Bin Reaper 3, but it's still not good. Stay away from this record. It's mid. Now, the next project we are going to be looking at is Boldy James's Indiana Jones. Now, again, if you've watched my videos in the past, you've probably heard me talk about this record. And let me just sum it up quick. Now, Boldy James, I obviously love. I think he's phenomenal. I actually met him. Super cool guy. Super chill. But I've been getting a little bit tired of his recent records as they've just become less innovative and less interesting. Now, the Nicholas Craven joint was really good. And the Real Bad Man project earlier in the year was dope. But those last two records he had, I was just really starting to lose interest. They weren't innovating on anything he did. And his style is only interesting for so long. So to hear Indiana Jones, this was a really refreshing record. Teaming up with producer Rich Gaines, Boldy was able to work in these more modernized and even trap sounding soundscapes for a lot of this record, and it added this really interesting coating of paint. Now, Boldy is still rapping about everything he usually does rap about, but just hearing him in this updated setting is captivating enough for the experience. Now, I'm not blown away by this record. I don't think it's amazing, but I definitely think it's formidable, and I think it is enjoyable, and I think anybody who enjoys Boldy James will have fun with this record. So I'm going to be putting Indiana Jones in C tier, just under Yeats Afterlife. Now, the next album we are going to be talking about is one of the most anticipated of 2023, and I'm sure it's the reason why a lot of you clicked on this video, Logic's College Park. Now, since 2020, Logic has been in a little bit of a renaissance, obviously outside of the Bobby Tarantino 3 mixtape, which was just to get out of his contract. But besides that, records like No Pressure and Vinyl Days have showed that Logic is in a place that we've really never seen him in. He's artistically free and he's spiritually happy and it's just really beautiful to see these things together. His recent projects have been so fun and they just show an artist who's creating purely just to create and College Park continues just on these things for better or for worse. Now, I love what Logic does conceptually on this album. Going back to his roots, rapping with his friends, talking about his desires when he wanted to blow up and when he wanted to get famous. But all in this light now that he's made it is just super interesting. It almost feels a little bit like Good Kid Mad City or even like Under Pressure to speak about Logic's own discography, but with this added context and with this more just relaxing and casual feel. There's so many highlights on this album like Lightsabers and Clone Wars, which just are super great tracks where Logic is rapping in this super emotional and personal way. He's super introspective and his pen game sounds amazing here just as usual, which should be no surprise. And the production is just as good. The way Logic layers this experience and narrates his life and brings along friends and classic collaborators like C. Castro is super super refreshing and it really brings you back to those old young sinatra days and now with that said and i know if you've listened to college park you've been waiting for this part the skits on this album which again incorporate a lot of logic's old friends big lembo c dot castro they really do put a toll a big toll on this record they really like they bring it down a couple of points that's how bad the skits are on this record and it's not that they're skits because I think if you maybe put a half or even a third of the skits on this record, I think that it would be fine. But the amount of damn skits that Logic had to put on this record was just insane. I could not believe that every single track, literally every single track on this record, and this has 17 tracks, this record runs for over an hour. There's a good like maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes maybe that skits. And it just gets so annoying now logic has always gotten a bad rep for being corny and i don't really think his rhymes anymore are that corny but they were at one period but man these skits really bring out that corny reputation as they are just so annoying they're just so random sometimes like 
you know, the jokes Logic goes for just don't really resonate with me. I mean, granted, I'm, I'm not from Logic's generation, so maybe these jokes are not landing just for me, but it seems like everybody is not understanding and not really vibing with Logic's jokes. I mean, I think the best song on this album is Village Slum. It's an intense and a really somber track that just feels so empty because Logic is talking about alcoholism, how it's plagued his family, and how he doesn't want it to plague him. I mean, that's some real deep material. And at the end of the track, we get a skit, which obviously shows Logic in a situation where he's trying to avoid drugs. But at the end of the day, I don't really think that this sells the message of the track. Maybe now in a bite size, if all of the skits were not on the album and this was just one of the few, it would have been strong. But at this point, I think it actually tears down the message. And I think that Logic extending the track and maybe adding another verse or maybe adding a feature about somebody who has similar issues would have been a lot more powerful. Now, speaking of features, Logic also does have a list of nice collaborators on this record, including Joey Badass, Redman, Rizza, who's on the intro. And that's just a moment in itself. And I love how Logic alludes to, you know, making a track with Wu-Tang one day. Like there are just so many novelties to this album that if you're a fan of hip hop, if you're a fan of Logic, you will really appreciate. And the feature from Seth MacFarlane on self-medication. Wow. Like that is one of the most impressive features I have heard in a very long time. I didn't know that was in you, Seth. I got to give you credit for that. That was truly a dope moment with that Sinatra like singing. So while the skits definitely take a toll on the listening experience of College Park, it's still a super charming and a super fun record which showcases Logic just reminiscing on the past in such an intriguing and in such an insightful way as he's gained so much perspective from this point in time. All in all, College Park is an amazing record and it is another strong entry into Logic's catalog that I think anybody who enjoyed his past records will enjoy. I'm putting this record in B tier. The next record we are going to be looking at is from Griselda Records member and drum work record leader Conway the Machine and his top signee Jay Skeese on their first ever collaborative project, Pain Provided Profit. Now, if you like Conway, if you like Jay Skeese, you know exactly what you are getting yourself into with this record. Conway does his usual thing here, just rapping his absolute head off, asserting his dominance, telling everybody he's the greatest, and just throwing out some great punchlines. When it comes to Jay Skeese's performance, he really asserts himself as a potential future star of the Drumwork imprint and the entire Griselda Sonic movement, as he really shows how talented he is. He stands toe to toe with Conway on this project and never feels like he is weighing the project down. And that is truly something that is tough to say. Shout out to Jay Skeese, cause he did something that a lot of MCs failed to do. And he did it for an entire project. And now going forward, he definitely will have a lot more attention on him in the future. So when you look at this record, it obviously was never trying to do anything insane or that's super memorable in the fact that, you know, it's not one of Conway's heavy hitter projects. But at the same time, this album did a great job at providing Conway fans some new music to hold on to as something bigger comes. And it also showed fans that the drum work label is legit and that Jay Skeese is a legit future talent who is only going to be getting better in the future. So for all this record accomplishes, I'm going to be putting this within the C tier, and I'm going to be putting this above Afterlife and above Indiana Jones. Now, the next record we have is the most star-studded album of 2023, Dreamville's Creed 3 soundtrack. Now, I haven't seen Creed 3 yet, so I don't know how this soundtrack incorporates itself into the actual film, but what I can say is that the Creed 3 soundtrack picks up where Dreamville left off on D-Day. It's honestly amazing how many great compilation records Dreamville has been able to make at this point. This record is just another collection of super fun collaborations, super memorable moments, and songs that are holding off Dreamville fans as artists wait to release their next major projects. I mean, the collaborations on this record are just amazing. The intro track, Culture, with Reason, Mez, Simba, and Bay. It is an amazing track. My Boy with J.I.D. and Loot. 
Big Sean's on this record with East G, and I'm not the biggest fan of East G, but they actually did their thing on the track Anthem. J.I.D. and Tierra Wack go at it on In The Room. J. Cole's Adonis interlude, I mean, man, that track was amazing. The list goes on and on of all of these memorable tracks, and Dreamville just does an amazing job at fitting in all of this talent, encompassing all of their skills, and just fitting them all into this cohesive body of work even for a compilation album. I mean, this record is just on par with the quality of D-Day, and it's just a little bit worse than Revenge of the Dreamers 3. Cole really shines through here in his brief performance. Jid obviously continues his run from the Forever Story. Ari Lennox was a star on this record, delivering a ton of memorable performances. And even artists like Westside Boogie, who just had one feature, were super memorable. So all in all, I really enjoyed this record. Now, granted, it's a compilation record, so the ceiling is only so high, and I don't think it's on the par with Revenge of the Dreamers 3, as looking back at that album, it is just aging like wine. That truly was a legendary moment. But still, the Creed 3 soundtrack is one of the best projects of 2023 so far, and I'm going to be putting it at the top of the C tier. So right now, we've been looking at a lot of the just really good, really solid, and Really exceptional record so far, as we see our C tier is starting to fill up with albums that have just delivered on all of their promises of quality. The next project we are going to be looking at is French Montana's Coke Boys 6 Money Heist Edition. And the only heist that happens on this project is the one of your time, as this record is an hour and 22 minutes long. Now, let me just say this before I get into this. DJ Drama is not the problem on this record. Obviously, this is a Gangsta Grills mixtape, and Drama does his thing as always. Drama is a professional. He delivers legendary commentary no matter what project he is on, and he is never the problem when a record he is a part of fails. That is a 100% fact. So Drama, just, you're not the problem. I know you follow me on Instagram, you are not the problem, you are not the target. But for French Montana and the rest of the Coke Boys, this is some of the most thoughtless and pointless music I have ever heard in my life. I don't understand what the purpose in creating this project was other than just to, you know, cash in on DJ Drama's hot streak and to make a couple of bucks because this record is really, really, really bad. It's just a giant pile, a giant conglomerate of talent that's poorly utilized and that's placed around for no inherent purpose other than to just sell records. Benny the Butcher's on this record, ASAP Rocky's on this record, Stove God Cooks is on this record, you got a Chinks feature, of course, like, there is talented acts across the board on this project, but there is no purpose to any of those names or even any of the weaker names on this record as a whole. Everything is just pointless. This is the epitome of what's wrong in the music industry today. Please, I, I really, I really warn you, do not listen to this album unless you want a headache and unless you want to question your existence. This album is bad. It's straight up bad and it's really, really unenjoyable. It's not one of those albums that's like fun bad, you know, where it's like, an interesting attempt at being bad like you know like logic supermarket or even like chances the big day this is just so plainly bad please please stay away from this this is going in the f tier and i actually like thought about making a new tier for this album because that's just how frustrating it is fortunately we are talking about a good record now in key glocks glaucoma 2. Now, Key Glock is a rapper who I've always enjoyed in bite sizes, but I've never really been too deep into. He's never really captivated me for an entire body of work, but with Glaucoma 2, he really, really makes one of the most fun trap albums I've heard in quite some time. Now, Glock is not inventing anything new here. He is just simply mastering a formula, mastering a style that he's been using his entire career. Everything on this project feels so purposeful 
and it feels so just damn fun and exciting. His attitude, his swagger, it's all just such a joy to listen to. And the production on this record, it's so fine-tuned. It perfectly captures that southern trap sound that he wants to so well. All in all, there's nothing really else to say about this record other than that it's a good time. And if you like good trap albums, definitely give this one a spin as you are going to get something out of it. And this is going all the way up in B tier as the second best record on the tier list so far. The next project we are looking at is a collaboration record between Jim Jones and Hitmaker back in my prime. Now, Jim Jones is a rapper who, despite aging, has still stayed consistent, releasing new projects almost every year. And while he is not aging like wine, he's not aging poorly at all, and this project is just further proof of that. Overall, this project is a good, quick listen. At 8 songs and only 25 minutes, you can't really go wrong. Hitmaker does his thing on the production. There is a lot of highlights like YKTV with Ty Dolla Sign and FU Better with Jeremiah. Overall, Jim Jones just kicks it over some nice beats and there's always room in hip hop for projects like this. So I'm going to be putting Back In My Prime by Jim Jones all the way up in the C tier in between Afterlife and Indiana Jones. The next project we are going to be looking at is Kenny Mason's 3 EP. Coming off the collaborations with Jid, Dreamville, Jake Cole, Lil Wayne, after releasing his Russ project, which was another really fun project, Kenny Mason continues to show that he is just diving into any territory that he feels like, and this is a really good thing. Now, 3 EP is obviously only three songs, as said in the name, but for a three-song project, it does a pretty damn good job at just showing us where Kenny Mason is at. Now, on one hand, I think that Kenny is still searching for a signature sound, as the sounds between Angelic Hood, Rad, Supercut, and then Ruffs are completely different, and this project continues that same trend, as Kenny just keeps diving deeper and deeper into these more unique sounds. Now, I don't know where Kenny will stop as I think he's super well-rounded and I think that can both be a gift and a curse in today's music industry as people want to associate artists with a specific talent, sound, feeling, style. So I don't really know where this will put Kenny commercially in the long run, but I definitely think that artistically hearing him just play around and have fun with all these different styles is super fun and super captivating. So I'm going to be putting Kenny Mason's 3 EP in the C tier. Now granted, this is an EP, so can't really be compared to albums, but it's just a solid body of work that you should give a listen if you enjoy Kenny Mason. Now, the next record is one that I've talked about in multiple videos. I've posted about it multiple times on my Instagram page, Lil Yachty's Let's Start Here, which this album is just amazing, man. It's aging better and better every single day. Hearing the Black Seminole for the first time is like a core memory of my music experience ever. Like that really was one of the most magical moments and it still is. It still has that same magic and that's what makes Let's Start Here so special. This really wasn't a just one-off thing. People were like, oh, it's going to age poorly. Oh, it's only good because it's different. No, this project is aging gracefully so far and it's only been three months, but still. It's getting better with every single listen. There are no bad songs. The project flows seamlessly, and it just invigorates this magic in your soul that sparks your love for music entirely. It really shows you why people enjoy music and why they connect with music at a fundamental level. I really love this album, and I'm going to be putting it all the way up in the A tier for all the reasons I said. I really hope I can see Lil Yachty perform this album live. And speaking of live performances, I have teamed up with SeatGeek to give you guys $20 off on your first purchase. Now, SeatGeek is an app where you can go on, look at an event, and if the deal is green, that means it's really good. And if it's red, it means you should stay away from it. Now, use code FHH for $20 off on your first purchase, and you can go experience any live event that you want. You can go catch a little Yachty show, or you can go see the Laker game. Whatever you want to do, use that code FHH to get $20 off of your first purchase. The next album we are going to be looking at is Don Tolliver's third studio album, Lovesick. 
Now, Don Tolliver was a rapper who I was really impressed by due to his features on Astro World, his performances on the Jack Boys compilation record, and I really did think that he was going to be what Baby Keem is to Kendrick or what Jid is to J. Cole to Travis Scott. Now, Heaven or Hell backed up every single claim of that, and that was really a great debut record with a ton of memorable moments, a really distinguished sound, and I was really excited for the future of his career. Then he dropped Life of a Don, and that record just wasn't it. It was just painfully mid, it was really boring, and it did not innovate or improve or remotely excite on any of the aspects that made his debut project so special. So, Going into Lovesick, I did not really have high expectations, but I will say I was pleasantly surprised by how enjoyable this record was. Don really found his footing once again here as he found a way to use his vocals and his talents in a really innovative and unique way. He creates this ambient space on the record with his hazy vocals and his love-filled lyrics, and overall, the vibe of this album is just so amazing. The album cover really does a perfect job at encapsulating what the sonics for this album represent as it really does feel like Don Tolliver is sitting within the city at night in the pouring rain and he's just wondering about love. He's wondering about failed opportunities, about current opportunities, and it's all put together so well. The features on this album are curated really well, and that was a surprise considering that track three, Leave the Club, features Glow Rilla and Lil Durk. When I saw this on the track list, I said, okay, here's the banger, here's the TikTok song, here's the song that's meant to sell this project, but actually, it's a really solid record that's a lot of fun. In addition to those two, artists like James Blake, Kaylee Uchlis, Justin Bieber, Wizkid, Charlie Wilson, Brent Fias, they all do an amazing job at absorbing us into this world. Now, speaking of Justin Bieber, the track Private Landing teams up Don, Justin Bieber, and Future together, and this track was just a banger. This was a really nice moment hearing these three together. Whenever Justin Bieber is with two rappers, he just does not miss. It brings something out in him that I don't know what, but if he had that on his last two records, they'd be a lot better, but that is a video for another day. All in all, the sonic world building on Lovesick is amazing. It is a super fun record. It is super enjoyable. And if you enjoy ambient trap albums, melodic rap albums, this is a record for you. Now, I'm going to be putting Lovesick all the way up in the B tier between Glaucoma 2 and College Park. The next album we are going to be looking at is Macklemore's Ben. Now, let's look at Macklemore for a second. Blow Up in 2012 with the Heist, Thrift Shop, Can Hold Us, you become a sensation. Now, it's really interesting with Macklemore because he was super popular and in one way, people look at him kind of as a one-hit wonder or a one-album wonder even. But also, because he won the Grammy in 2013 over Good Kid Mad City, People really just hate the dude. I mean, you can't mention Macklemore without one of the first things that come to your mind being that he won over one of the best hip hop albums of all time. And in a way, it's kind of unfortunate because that one event has put a hex over his career, but at least he's not making this amazing music that's overshadowed because Ben is not good. Now, I will say this, Fantano gave it a two and he was a little too harsh. It's not a two, it's not that bad. It's like a three. It had some potential, to be honest with you. I mean, the intro track actually seemed like it would take Macklemore in an interesting direction. It seemed like maybe we'd get some sort of introspective, personal, and really mature body of work from Macklemore. But by the time we're on track four, the album just gets really bland, really repetitive, and it's just really odd. This album is just generic pop rap, but it's weird in the way that it's an ensemble of all of the pop rap trends from 2012 to now, and you see that reflected in the track list with features from NLE Choppa, Murray, and it's overall just very weird. Now, I will say, DJ Premier has a feature on this record. There's a DJ Premier beat with DJ Premier scratches, and that's cool. I don't have anything else to say. I'm not going to say that it makes this album inherently better or that it makes it worth listening to. I just wanted to tell you guys that there is a primo feature and I think it's really cool. So overall, Ben, it's not that good. I'm going to be putting it in the E tier 
and I'm going to be putting it below both Baby Drum projects, which will tell you a lot. Now, the next project we are going to be looking at is from abstract hip-hop artist Maxo. Even God has a sense of humor. And Maxo has been a rapper that I have been a pretty big fan of since hearing his album Lil Big Man in 2019. And I was literally just scrolling through Instagram and I saw he dropped this album like a couple days later. I had no idea this project was coming. And this was a really really enjoyable listen i mean maxo continues on everything he was doing on little big man and really just improves on it this album is so personal it's so intimate and it's so introspective and that's really conveyed through both maxo's delivery and storytelling and also just the sonic atmosphere of this project everything is so minimal and it's super low-key and overall it just makes you feel like you're sitting within a dark room with Maxo and you're just having a conversation with him and that intimacy it's something that I really appreciate as you just really get to know the artist behind everything you catch up with him you see where he's at and it's overall a really powerful listen now I hope we see more albums like this in the abstract hip-hop realm as I really do think this perfects the formula and keeps it in a way where it's super accessible and a lot of people can actually enjoy it so I am going to be putting this album all the way up in B tier, and I'm going to be putting it above College Park. So I do really think this record is amazing. Definitely give it a listen. Shout out, Maxo. The next project we are going to be looking at is a collaborative effort between Che Noor and Big Ghost LTD, Noor or Never. Now, if you're not familiar with Che Noor, she is one of the illest MCs in the underground right now. She's taken that grimy style that Griselda has popularized, and she has this conscious spin to it that makes her music so interesting and potent. If you listen to a project like Food for Thought, you'll be left thinking about a lot of complex issues and thinking about them in lights that you never may have thought of before. On the other hand, if her amazing 2022 run, she dropped a project like The Last Remnants, which took that conscious style and added a lot more fire to it, and that was a really nice change of pace. So when it comes to Noor Never, I expected Che Noor to offer her same style and same repertoire of skills, but in a little bit of a different light, and when it comes to the execution of this, I thought it was really just average. Now don't get me wrong, if you enjoy Che Noor, you will enjoy this project, but you're not going to love it any bit more than you loved her previous records as it just feels like she's running through her usual bag of tricks and not really adding to them in any way that's interesting. There's not enough conscious food for thought lyricism and there's not enough fire. So all in all, it just leaves you with this very plain and very safe state of her performance. And I mean, it's all right, but it's not anything to write home about. And on the production side of things, I think this is where this project really weakens to me as Big Ghost beats just don't have that same kick that they once had. Now, obviously, they're not supposed to be this super inviting and super soulful type of instrumentals, but still, they don't feel anywhere near as interesting or as well layered as they once did on records like Griselda Ghost. All in all, I think that the talent on this record is clearly there, but I feel that they just played it way too safe. And for that reason, I'm going to be putting this project in D tier, as I just think it's average. The next project we are going to be looking at is Young Nudie's Gumbo. And when you look at Young Nudie, he is really the definition of an artist who never misses. I mean, since the late 2010s, he has delivered a solid line of albums with a lot of high peaks, and at the worst, the records are just okay. I mean, from Slamir with Pierre Bourne to records like Rich Shooter and EA Monster in the previous few years, Nudie is always delivering heat. Now, while it may not be a trap classic, you will get a good listening experience. And on his latest project, Gumbo, he does that once again. This album is just fun. You get 13 songs of food-inspired tracks and Nudie just kicks it over these super exciting and super flashy trap beats. You get features from Key Glock and 21 Savage on this record, and all in all, it flows really well. Clocking in at 44 minutes, it stays a perfect amount of time. So, I really did enjoy Gumbo, and I do think it is a really solid record. Now, granted, the stakes are not super high, and it's not this crazy trap album, as I said, but it is another solid record in a long string of really, really solid releases from Young Nudie. So I'm going to be putting Gumbo in the C tier between the Creed 3 soundtrack and Pain Provided Profit. 
Now, the next record we are going to be looking at is allegedly the final album from Florida rapper Puya Gator. Now, similar to Young Nudie, Puya is a professional in every sense of the word. Each record he releases just packs that same amount of fun, and you can always count on him for delivering quality performances. Now, with Gator, I was expecting the same thing from Puya, and while we got just that, we also got a little more in some ways. The opening leg of this album, I was really blown away with. Everything was more personal than usual, more introspective, and the production styles Puya was playing around with were obviously implementing that dark shadow rap style from Florida, those three six mafia influences, but also it just had this new sense of creativity into it, which, which felt like a nice breath of fresh air. While all of this personality and excitement did not translate into the entire record as it played it a lot more safe and to Puya's more usual repertoire later in the record, I still did find myself having a lot of fun with this project and if you enjoy that shadow rap style, that aggressive trappy style, that 3-6 mafia influence style, check out Gator, it is a solid record, and shout out Puya. I'm going to be putting this record in C tier, I'm going to be putting it right near indiana jones now also teaming up with big ghost ltd we have rome streets with rome wasn't built in a day now similar to chaynor rome is also a very strong rapper in the underground who just had a career year arguably he has been on hell of a hot streak and after signing to griselda records things got only better he has been on a crazy hot streak since the 2020s, and after signing with Griselda last year, appearing on records like West Side Gun, Star Studded, and Immaculate 10, and then releasing his own Griselda project with Kiss the Ring, Rome really set the bar high for the future. So, I understand the whole business model behind the Griselda artists, and it kind of works in this way where... You know, you have your main projects, which for Rome would be Kiss the Ring, or for Conway would be God Don't Make Mistakes, but the whole success behind the formula is that they are always able to provide fans quality experiences with, you know, a record like Pain Provided Profit or Wasn't Built in a Day. You know, these are mini chapters while you wait for those next major releases, and I don't always think people realize that because there's different purposes and different ceilings for each project to come out of the Griselda camp and the camp of the Griselda collaborators. So this record should not be compared to Kiss the Ring. That's what I'm saying, because I've heard a lot of people talking about it and saying, oh, it's dope, but you know, it's not Kiss the Ring. And yeah, you're totally right, because Kiss the Ring was made with a lot more purpose and it had a lot more prowess to it. Now, that doesn't mean that wasn't built in a day is not enjoyable, but if you have super high expectations for the Griselda releases, just know you're not going to be as satisfied with this release as you would with a record like Kiss the Ring. So when it comes to how Wasn't Built in a Day actually is, it's just fine. I mean, you can kind of expect what you're getting into without even listening to this project. It's just more of Rome's fiery lyricism over Big Ghost production, which I do think is a little better here than it was on Nor or Never, although I still do have similar issues that I feel that the production is lacking compared to where it once was a few years ago. Now, differentiating this experience just enough, there are a ton of features on this project with actually features on every single song. Now, we see Swab featured on almost the entire project and also MCs like Lukey Cage on the project as well. Now, we get a Conway feature also, and we even get a Method Man Rome Streets collab P's and Q's, which is the highlight of the record to me. So, all in all, I think this record is coded just differently enough to separate itself and to stand on its own compared to Kiss the Ring. And while it's obviously not that, while the stakes are obviously lower, you will enjoy this record if you are a fan of Rome Streets, if you are a fan of the Griselda movement, and that Method Man track is truly a gem. So definitely give that a listen at least. And for all the reasons I have said, I'm going to be putting Wasn't Built in a Day at the end of the C tier.
The next project we are looking at is a collab EP between the S Boys, who I can't say their full name because of the YouTube algorithm, and Shake Well in Shameless. And then I can't say the name, but it is the S word, as you probably would assume at this point. And this is a six song EP that runs for 18 minutes long. And similar to Puya, similar to Young Nudie, the S Boys are one of those artists who always deliver quality experiences. They have never made a bad record now i don't think they've ever made a great record but they've never made a bad record and there is something really admirable in that and this ep continues that but it actually puts their sound in a little bit of a different light and this is much appreciated now it takes obviously that same shadow rap that same dark memphis inspired style and it mixes it a little bit with whole lot of red and i mean you could literally see that reflected in the track list like there's a song named whole lot of gray the influence is clearly there and i think it works really well i think hearing the s boys is chaotic but you know super traumatized and scarred style over this intense production which fuses their intensity with the rage style which is taking over hip-hop right now i think it's really 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 well done and I think that it's one of the more interesting releases that we've seen in this year in its entirety. Now, what this record really opens me up to is the prospect of the S Boys kind of taking a little more of a lane swerve into this style. I think that that's something that they could be really good at. And I think it's something they could actually potentially do better than artists like Yeet. So all in all, this project sells me on this new sound, this new more ragey style for the s boys and i think that this could really turn into something even more prominent than we ever thought so i think this ep may have been a way for them to tease what's coming next or for them to kind of sell it to us but overall i mean this was a really really enjoyable project and i'm gonna be putting this all the way up in the c tier and i'll be putting it right in between jim jones's record and boldy james's project the next record we are going to be looking at is Sky Zoo's Mind of a Saint. And I've already talked about this record. It is a collab album between Sky Zoo and the production tandem of the other guys. And if you've listened to a Sky Zoo album, you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. Again, Sky Zoo is very similar to the S Boys, to Puya, and to Young Nudie, except on a way higher mark of execution and with a way higher bar for quality. But in the sense that these guys never miss on record. Sky Zoo always delivers quality. He always delivers great lyricism, great food for thought ideas. And he does that here again, except it's just not as good as some of his previous projects. I mean, that's really it. It's a conscious album. It's a really fun, really strong, really well put together conscious album, but it just doesn't have that sonic kick to it. And it doesn't have that narrative structure to it for me to really praise it and put it in, let's say the B or even the A tier. So all in all, I think this is a solid record, but I'm not blown away by this to the highest degree. So I'll be putting Mind of a Saint right in the C tier. I'll be putting it right in between Gator and Indiana Jones. So we've had a lot of projects in the C tier so far, and that's a good thing. I mean, some people think the C tier is mid, but I think when you look at it in its entirety, if we have the S tier, which, you know, has been unreached so far by artists in this year, in my opinion, the B tier is really good. The C tier is good. Like that is a high bar of quality with the D tier being average and then E and F being something you don't want to be in. But the C tier really is, you know, the mark for where records should be hitting and then everything should go up from there. So Overall, I mean, these are all good records. The C tier is not disrespect. It's just a solid project. But, you know, in actuality with the C tier, are we going to be talking about any of these records in, you know, two or three years from now? Probably not. And when you look at the B tier, when you look at the A tier, those records have a lot more staying power. Speaking of staying power, the next record we are going to be looking at is Ugly from Slow Thigh. And when you look at this album, wow. <laughs> Wow, I mean, just thinking about this album, I am at a loss for words. This is one of the most out of left field albums that hip hop has seen in the past 10 years. That's how good 
and that's just how creative this project is. Now, Slothai is an artist too. The world has always been at his fingertips creatively. He's been able to do a ton of things. He's been able to make crazy high intensity bangers. And he's also been able to make these super introspective emotional reflections seen on records like Tyron. I mean, his discography so far has been really strong and adding this album, it takes him to the next level. Now, this record infuses a ton a ton of stuff from post-punk hip-hop alternative this record really fuses a bunch of things together and puts it in this genreless position i mean this record shows how far hip-hop has gone in the sense that the the genre is it, genreless i mean there's no definitive sound to what these records are doing and very similar to lil yachty they are starting to show that Hip-hop is becoming more of a creative entity in certain ways than an actual art form with rules. And I think that that's a really good thing as it just creates this way more diverse creative pool. And it creates this bar where you don't know what's going to happen next. And I know somebody's going to be in the comments and be like, oh, it's not a hip-hop album. It's not a hip-hop album. But it clearly has, you know, strong influences of hip-hop along with other genres. So tell me what genre it is if it's not a hip-hop album. But to talk about this actual record, this is a masterclass of a personal dissection of a man and his inner feelings and his conflicts and his torment and his fear. Everything here is so well mapped out. You feel Slothai's emotions bleeding into your heart. And that's something you can't say about a lot of records. And this is done through his very chunky but very powerful style of lyricism here. Everything feels like a block in itself. Every bar feels like it's its own thought and these thoughts just kind of build on each other and they create this sluda mind state and that's done really well and by delivering his lyrics in this manner you get this really diluted and conflicted mind state with a ton of opposing thoughts and a ton of opposing feelings and this is all brought even more to life through Slothai's vocal performance which contains some truly horrifying screams and some truly horrifying pockets flows and just overall tenacity I mean, this record is intense. Like, don't listen to this record before you go to bed because you will be up all night just scared, honestly. Just scared. Like, this album gets horrifying at times. And I think that that's one of its biggest strengths. It does not shy away from showing any of the ugliness. And that is not a pun. It does not shy away from any of the ugliness of our human emotions. And all in all, it just becomes a truly powerful and impactful body of work because of this. Now, this record really does require a more thoughtful dissection where I could talk about the actual themes and the motives behind what makes it special. And I will be working on an in-depth review on this project in the future. But for now, just know that it is amazing and it is one of the most powerful, emotional, and just shocking and creative experiences that hip-hop has had to offer in quite some time. So, if you guessed it, I am going to be putting this album in the A tier. And I'm going to be putting it above Let's Start Here. Which, you know, I said I love Let's Start Here. So that should really just show you how good I think this record is. And to foil that, we're going to be looking at Trippy Red's Mansion Music. Now, I've talked about this album already. And I don't think it's good. I think it really shows everything wrong in hip hop right now as just has this super bloated track list, so many features that are here pointlessly, a clickbaity executive production credit from Chief Keef, which if you've listened to Chief Keef, you know that his mind makes bangers, his vision creates greatness. This is not that. This is not good. Very similar to Coke Boy 6 but except in a way that's a lot more playful as the features are just a lot more interesting inherently. I mean, you know, this is one of those records, and I said this in my review, where, you know, you have albums that are just painfully bad. This is kind of a little more fun bad, although it's not like, you know, Speeding Bullet to Heaven, Big Day, where, you know, it's an interesting attempt at being bad, which I just think it's hilarious that this is the point we're at talking about records, but... It's still in the sense where it's like, oh, Travis Scott's on this song. Maybe it'll be all right. Or, oh, Juice World's on this song. Maybe it'll be all right. And yeah, there are some okay moments. But overall, everything just feels really phoned in. And asking somebody to sit down through 25 songs of a trippy red project that spanned for over an hour and 16 minutes. Again, that is a crime. And I got to put it in the F tier. So we already got two F tier albums in 2023. 
but I'm going to be putting this above Coke Boy 6 as I think that it is a little better in retrospect. The next record we are going to be looking at is Sugar World from Jonathan Lean Doer 96, who you may know by his real alias Young Lean, and this is another record from Lean's alter ego, and this project is really interesting. Now, I think this is a really interesting record, which I like better in theory than in the actual execution of it. Now, Lean's taking things in a little more of a rock-oriented direction, and this really livens up the production of the music. Um, you know, as opposed to Lean's usual style, which is a lot more ghostly and faint, the production here is the driving force of the music in ways that is kind of unexpected. And I think that the production on this project is really great. It's really exciting. Tracks like Rivers of Another Town really highlight just how bold and just how creative the production is here. But... I think that Lean's inability to adapt and really evolve his vocal style just leaves this project feeling like it's getting pulled in two different directions. On one side, he's still doing the same things he would do on any of his other records, and on the other, the project is trying to be really innovative sonically. So all in all, I think that this record is definitely solid in the sense that it exposes you to something interesting and something we've never seen from Lean. I think that it does need some work in terms of its execution, and that if he can just get a little bit better with this style, we may have a really, really great record on his hand. All in all, though, this is just another really interesting project from Young Lean, and while I think its execution is rather poor, I really appreciate the attempt of one of the most creative rappers of the 2010s doing another super creative thing. I'm going to be putting this project in D tier, though, above nor or never, as I do think this project is, you know, it's all right, but, you know, it's not amazing. The next project we are going to be looking at is from one of the greatest producers of all time, Ninth Wonder with Zion 8. Now, Ninth Wonder Zion series has become a staple of his career over the past few years, and there has been some really, really great albums in the series. Zion 6, I thought was phenomenal. Zion 3, I thought was really good, and Zion 2 were all really enjoyable projects. Now, with that said, Ninth Wonder has given us Zion 7 and 8 pretty close together in late 2022 and early 2023. And when it comes to these later installments in the series, I feel like they are losing a lot of what made them special in the first place. Now, this record is a mainly instrumental album that features some vocal sections from Amber Narvin and King Draft. And overall, I just think this record lacks a lot of the same spice that the earlier installments had. Now, granted, this album is still cool if you want to study and throw it on, if you want to just relax and throw it on, but I don't think it has that high value that the earlier ones had, where the earlier ones felt like they were really putting a piece of Ninth Wonder's soul out for us to imagine. This just feels like more of a routine exercise for Wonder as opposed to something that holds a lot of emotional value. So. Overall, I mean, again, this is an average project, but it is nothing to write home about. So, for all of the reasons I have said, I'm going to be putting Zion 8 in the D tier, in between Sugar World and Nor or Never. As we get to the finale of this list, we have NBA Youngboy's first and so far only project in 2023, which let's just say that's really impressive that Youngboy's only dropped one record so far, and we are almost halfway through March. So, Young Boys, I rest my case. Um, it is an album. Uh, I don't really know what else to say. I mean, it's Young Boy doing Young Boy. I don't really know how else to put it. It's boring. It's unadventurous. It's uninnovative. Any other negative word you could really just throw in that sentence and you get the vibe. Young Boy's really got to change something up if he wants to be taken seriously as an artist. But I mean, I know he doesn't. He just wants a check, which listen, I get. He wants to make his money. So, you know. Have fun making your money and getting your streams, and I'm going to have fun putting your projects in the F tier. And yep, you guessed it, this is the worst album of the year so far, going behind Coke Boy 6 and Mansion Music, which man, that says a lot. And again, while I've said that those albums are bad, and you know, they're bad in different ways, this album is bad in the worst way, where... It just does nothing. I mean, you could really, you could swap this album out with really any other young boy project and put it in your headphones and you would never know the difference unless you saw the difference in covers. I mean, that's really it. And that's really sad 
that this is the point we're at creatively with one of the biggest artists of our generation. The next project we are going to be looking at is Just For Clarity 2 from Blast, which is just a four song EP, but this is another really solid and really enjoyable project from one of the most talented rappers in the melodic hip hop space right now. Now, Blast is really pushing forward a new generation of melodic rappers with records like No Love Lost, Before You Go, and he got that huge feature spot on Kendrick Lamar's Die Hard, and he was the highlight of that song. I mean, I really love what this guy's doing. He understands his skill set so well, and he once again shows that on this new four-song EP. Now, this gives us a perfect size of new Blast tracks to hold us over as we wait for his next major body of work, and he just continues doing what makes him great. Now, the track Ghetto Cinderella is a super, super fun track with DJ Mustard production. It has the same key pattern that Big Pun's classic Not A Player has, so that was a really nice way to incorporate a classic sample without making it gimmicky or without playing and nostalgia baiting us. So I thought that was really nice. Passionate with Roddy Rich was an amazing collab as Blast and Roddy just trade verses between their beautiful vocals. And in a lot of ways, I would really like to see a collab album from these two as I think that Blast brings out the best in Roddy. And Roddy really needs that right now. He does need a little bit of a career pick me up. But overall, I think that this record is super enjoyable. I think it's super solid. And as far as an EP goes, it really does an amazing job. And it maximizes what the use of an EP is. It perfectly holds us over. Now, granted, I'm comparing this to full length records. So there's only such a high place I'm going to put it in. But you guessed it. I'm going to be putting this in the C tier. I'm going to be putting this pretty high up. I'm going to be putting this all the way in front of Indiana Jones. So shout out to Blast. He's really keeping hip hop exciting. Now, these last two projects are two of the most interesting of 2023 so far. And the first is obviously the viral Ice Spices Like. So when it comes to how I feel about this project, I think it's all right. I don't think it's amazing, but I also don't think it's terrible. I think that a lot of people are really hating on Ice Spice just because she's huge. And listen, I get it. A rapper who's not that good, who goes absolutely viral. It could be frustrating when, you know, they have more monthly listeners than J. Cole. But still, I don't think that that's a valid reason to just say that somebody's terrible because Ice Spice is not terrible. Honestly, she makes a lot more interesting mainstream music than a lot of other artists right now. I mean, if you look in the New York drill scene, in the melodic New York scene, she is like the best artist in that whole realm right now. Her hits are catchy, her bangers are fun, and I mean, the way she raps is pretty interesting, and it's a lot more tolerable, and hell, it's a lot more welcoming than any of the aggressive and banterous styles that a lot of the New York rappers are chasing the charts with. So, all in all, I mean, Ice Spice doesn't have the next to pimp a butterfly on her hands, but it's a solid record. I mean, this is an average body of work. There is solid songs, there are solid moments, and... If you can just enjoy yourself a little bit, you will enjoy this project. And I think that Ice Spice has some potential going forward. I think she could make a really, really fun debut album with the right features and with the right producer. So, so I'm going to be putting this record in the D tier and pretty high up in it as I think this is an average project that just offers a lot of fun stuff. It's nothing to get mad about. There's nothing that problematic about it. And yeah, I get it. She's got more streams than Cole right now. She's got more streams than like every rapper out right now. But what are you going to do, man? I mean, just enjoy the music. As Ice Spice says, how could you lose if you already choose? I mean, that's a bar. Come on, that's a bar. Speaking of bars, the last album we are going to be looking at this month is Taleb Kweli and Mad Lib's collab album, Liberation 2. Now, I know what you're saying. Telequilly and Madlib dropped a collab album, and yes, they did. Now, it's not on streaming services. You can only access it on the podcast platform Luminary, which you would have to pay a subscription to here, which, you know, that's its own conversation. That's its own debate. I'm not here to talk about if the project should be on streaming, if it shouldn't. If you want to debate about it in the comments, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but this is not going to be a rant about how it's not on streaming. We're just going to be talking about about the body of work as I purchased the subscription and I've heard the album and I want to talk about it. So, Taleb Kweli and Madlib have come together just a few months after No Fear of Time, which was obviously Taleb, Most Deaf, 
and Mad Lib. And this record is a lot more meatier and it packs a lot more than No Fear of Time did. I mean, just from the feature list alone, you got features from Q-Tip, Mac Miller, Rock Marciano, West Side Gun. I mean, that's a pretty nice feature list and it was pretty enticing in me purchasing the subscription for me to listen to this project. But when it comes to the execution of this record, I think it's really done well. I mean, Talib delivers his fiery, thoughtful bars, and while he may get a little annoying sometimes, while he may get a little too preachy sometimes, I mean, it's all right. And at the end of the day, Madlib's production is really good here, and I actually think it's better than it was on No Fear of Time, as that felt a little half-baked sometimes, if we're going to be honest in retrospect. But all in all, I think that this record is a very interesting project. I think it's a solid project. I think if you want to listen to it, if you like Telib, if you like Madlib, if you want to hear a new Mac performance, I think it's definitely worth your time. But again, if you want to purchase that subscription, that is up to your own decision-making. So, for all that Liberation 2 does... I'm going to be putting this in the B tier, and I'm going to be putting it in between Love Sick and College Park. So, here we are, one-fourth into 2023, and you can see everything major that's dropped, and you can see where hip-hop's at. So, so we're yet to get an album that's in the S tier, and we've had a couple that are in the F, a couple that are in the E, and a couple that are just average, but overall, I mean, we've gotten a lot of solid bodies of work, as you can see. A lot of these records have fun moments that you'll definitely get a lot of joy out of. And when you look in the A tier and even the B tier, you got a ton of really fun and really interesting records that you will really get a lot out of if you're into those respective subgenres and styles or just pure innovativeness. So overall, I mean, for the beginning of the hip hop year, it's not the best start, but it's far from the worst start, especially when you look at the beginning of years like 2021, which literally had no major music coming out at all. So let me know your thoughts on this tier list. Let me know your thoughts on what the best albums are. Was I too harsh on some records? Was I too easy on some records? Please let me know everything in the comments and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you've made it to this part. We got more tier list rankings coming. We got more videos coming. We got more interviews coming. We got a lot of really great stuff on the way. So be sure to stay around for that. Thank you all for watching. Mr. Fantastic, Fantastic Hip Hop, signing out. Have a great day.